Hello again and welcome to 9.5. Um, 9.5 is the next to last section that we'll be doing in chapter 9. And 9.5 is the graphs of the other trig functions because we did sine and cosine, which would be the, the two that are used most prevalently uh, last section. So this is the other four trig functions that we're going to be looking at the graphs of. Before we start, I have two math jokes for you. I know that you're going to enjoy them. The first is, what kind of a tree was Hipparchus's favorite? What's that? You, what kind you ask? It was trigonoma tree, because Hipparchus is considered the father of trigonometry. And the follow-up to that, what kind of a tree was Euclid's favorite? That's right, you guessed it. It was geometry. You're laughing. I know, at least on the inside, you're laughing. Uh, you can see on the calendar that we had said we're only going to be doing a 9.5 partial, as in, um, as since, since the quarantine remote learning is producing open book, open note tests, I don't really care if you know why the graph of tangent looks the way it does um, or that you could produce the parent graph of tangent by yourself again in pre-calc i will care if you have me for pre-calc next year then we will care that, that you could produce that yourself or that you know why it is how it is but for this year we don't we just need you to know what these four graphs look like and then how to manipulate the graphs and manipulate the equations um, so make sure that you get a real good picture of the parent function from either the textbook or Google or your notes or somewhere, but that you have a really nice picture of the parent function because I think then that'll make the section a lot easier for you because you'll be able to see the transformations a lot better. So let's go ahead and talk about some components of the tangent function as well as the cotangent function. First off, both of these are periodic functions because they do repeat on a cycle, but the period is not too pi like it was for sine and cosine um, because and I used Desmos to get these graphs. And so the asymptotes are not drawn. Turns out that these functions both have asymptotes. And we've done functions that have asymptotes. We did rational functions, and we also did uh, exponential functions that had horizontal asymptotes. And so Desmos does not draw in the asymptotes or the arrows. But turns out that the tangent function and the cotangent function both have infinite vertical asymptotes, which is kind of cool. That's infinite places that the graph is undefined, but it's still only every now and then. And how far apart are the asymptotes? So to look and see how far apart they are, three pi halves minus pi halves would just be two pi halves, which is pi. So the period of the tangent function is pi for the parent, which means if we would go to transform it, that the period would now be not 2 pi over b, but just pi divided by b, if we have a, b, c, d, because the, p, the parent period is pi, not 2 pi. Um, also, we can see that the, um, we don't really talk about it having a, a principal axis or a midline. We don't re really use that word here with the tangent function, but it's, it is centered that the y values here are centered um, on the x-axis. And that the part above the x-axis here is concave up like a cup, and the part underneath is concave down like a frown. Um, and so that's what we want to look at when we see the tangent function. We can also see that it achieves this value of y equals 1 at the angle pi over 4. So that would be pi over 4, 1. Um, and similarly, negative pi fourths, negative one. That'll help us as if we're trying to compare to see if we've stretched it or not, because if we don't have that point there, we won't really be able to see how much we've stretched the tangent function. The cotangent function is similar, except that the asymptotes are in different spots. So notice that on the tangent function, the tangent of zero is zero. It goes through the point zero, zero. But for cotangent, the cotangent of zero is undefined. Uh, cotangent is cosine divided by sine. And I know that the sine of the angle zero, the sine, which is the y value here on the unit circle, is zero. And so 
the cotangent would be the cosine, which is one, divided by zero, and you can't divide by zero. So that's why it's undefined. Again, I'm gonna try to not do too much explaining of the why to you because it doesn't really matter if you know why for algebra two. You'll have plenty of time to learn that next year. I just get excited because I know what's coming up for you in pre-calc. Okay, so the cotangent function also has a period of pi over b because the parent period is pi, um, but the asymptotes are in different places. And then if you look, the cotangent function is decreasing on each piece of its domain. Um, but it's going down from left to right as you read a book, where the tangent function is increasing on its domain. All right, uh, let's also talk about the cosecant and secant functions. So the cosecant function is also um, we could think of it as the reciprocal of the sine function, and the secant function is the reciprocal of the cosine function. We did that in 9.1. And so you can see that because sine and cosine are the same except for a shift, the cosecant and secant functions are also the same uh, except for a shift. So, and they also, just like the other um, ones, tangent and cotangent, they also have an infinite number of vertical asymptotes here. So if this is zero and then this one is pi, then I can see that the asymptotes happen every pi units, but the period of the function has to be a complete cycle. So the period would have to be the top part and the bottom part, and then it starts repeating. So the period of these functions is two pi, which means that when you transform them, that the period is still two pi over p. Uh, it also is, the y values are kind of centered um, on the x-axis here for the parent function, but we don't call that a principal axis or a midline since it's not a sinusoid, since, which means a sine or cosine function. Uh, and then we would draw arrows on these because they do continue in the direction that they look like they're heading. The secant function uh, is the same except shifted. So I know that the cosine of zero degrees, again, think about zero degrees to try to tell them apart. Um, the cosine is one and the reciprocal of one is one, so I'm okay there. But for cosecant, which is one over sine, sine of zero on the unit circle is zero, and that's why you've got an asymptote right there. Um, also, notice that these graphs never go in between negative one and one, like that's totally blank there. Um, because if you look here is what the cosine function looks like. So the reciprocal of a number that's less than one is always a number that is greater than one. And um, that's another little fun trick how you can kind of draw the sine and cosine functions in. And then you can see how the secant and cosecant functions fit. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing today is we need to just practice some manipulating um, equations and then manipulating the graphs. I put these first two on there that are not trig, um, just so you can see how they parallel, how all of the stuff that we're doing in Algebra 2, um, we're doing the same stuff, right? But with all of the different families of functions. And so because of that, hopefully, if you understood the previous stuff, it should make this easier. Um, this material should be easier. So go ahead, I'll do x squared. If I wanted to vertically stretch that times three, that would become three x squared. If I wanted then to take that and cumulatively shift that right one unit, I would change that and make that three times quantity x minus one squared. And then if I wanted to move that function down four, I would get three times x minus one, quantity squared minus four. Um, see if you can go ahead and do that with y equals e to the x, which we had learned a couple chapters after we did x squared. And then also see if you can figure out how to do that with y equals sine x. Uh, and pause your video screen while you're working on that. And then check it and unpause in three, two, one. Okay, here you go to check your work. Uh, for e to the x, uh, you'd have three times e to the x, three times e to the quantity x minus one, and three times e to the quantity x minus one minus four. Uh, and then for sine x, you would have three times sine x, 
three times sine of quantity x minus one and three times quantity sine x minus one minus four. Um, hopefully you got those right. And now we're gonna do some that look almost the same, but we're going to switch the order around and we're gonna see how that matters. Uh, we did this earlier in the year, so I don't think that should be too terribly difficult. But now I'd like you to do the same um, three transformations, but I've switched the order for you. So go ahead and pause your screen. I will too, and then we'll compare in three, two, one. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and check. Um, for x squared, you'd have x minus one quantity squared, x minus one quantity squared minus four. But then when you go to vertically stretch, because I'm doing that after I've shifted it down four, then I have to vertically stretch that whole thing, both of those terms, which means that, uh, that what was four units away from the x-axis is now going to be 12 units away from the x-axis because the whole y value gets multiplied by three. I know that it's been a while since you've seen that. So just wanted to refresh you on that. Uh, e to the x would be the same, um, the same theory, right? So you'd end up with three times e to the x minus one power minus 12. And for sine of x, you would get three times sine of quantity x minus one and then minus 12. So that's manipulating the equations. And then I also want to just look at how um, we can look at just some basic changes in the graphs. We're not gonna go too wild here. Uh, and hopefully the, the test questions won't go too wild either. I can't choose your test questions. Uh, and I know that sometimes they show you different numbers even than what I've previewed and some of them are quite tricky. So hopefully um, I, from what I saw in the textbook, um, they're not going too crazy on these either. So I wanted to show you a couple with tangent and then that's a couple with secant that we're going to practice manipulating the graphs. If I wanted to graph y equals two tangent x, then that would be a vertical stretch times two. It's not going to look much different at all because the asymptotes, sorry that these don't look very vertical. Um, the asymptotes are gonna be in the same spot, vertically stretching uh, times two does not change a vertical asymptote. Also the zeros, would be the same because vertically stretching, anything times zero is still zero. So those aren't going to change. So that's why it's nice that we knew that it went through pi fourths one, because if I want to vertically stretch that function, then it's going to go through pi fourths two. And every time that the original function hit a y value of one, our new function would hit a y value of two. Every time the original function hit a y value of negative one, which is what I'm marking, the new function would hit a y value of two, negative two. So this makes it the same shape and it's harder to, to produce something that still looks concave up on top and concave down on the bottom. So you have to be careful. You don't want it to look linear, um, but it's harder because it's stretched out. And so you'd have something that looks like that. And so if we're stretching it, you can see that that doesn't change very much. Uh, and again, you'd want to grab it Ooh, that one, that one's a little uglier. Sorry about that. Um, and you would want to go all the way across your graph space uh, with this, so I'm gonna quickly go, there you go, across the graph space. Uh, and then let's try this one as well. The second one says tangent of one third x. So that would be a horizontal stretch by a factor of three. Um, we could figure out then the new period if we wanted to, or we could just look at each of these values, each of the x values and multiply uh, the x value by three, because I would be dividing it by one third. This is going to change your vertical asymptotes. So zero stretched out the y coordinate um, or the x coordinate of zero when it stretched would still be zero, not a big deal. But the asymptote that was at pi over two, if I stretch that by multiplying that by three, then now that becomes three pi over two for the very first asymptote past the y-axis. And the asymptote that was at negative pi halves, if I multiply that by three, because it's uh, tangent of one third x, means that this is the first asymptote to the left of the y-axis. Uh, also then, if I know that pi fourths is where the function normally hits one, if I multiply that by three, then that would be three pi over four. So I've got to think about where that would be. So I've got one fourth pi, a half pi, this would be three fourths pi, and then pi. So at three fourths pi, that's where it would hit the y value of one. 
and that negative three-fourths pi is where it would hit the y value of negative one. So this one is going to look something like that. And again, it would have a piece over here and it would have a piece over there as well, but you wouldn't see very much of it. In fact, if I really wanted to graph two full periods of this, I would need to um, elongate my graph space because right now I'm showing you a period in the middle and then a tiny bit on the ends, but I'm certainly not showing you two full periods. Uh, what would the period be? Normally the period is pi. So for this graph, the period would be pi divided by one third, which would be pi times three which is three pi. And I can see that because this is positive three halves pi and that's negative three halves pi. And so if I subtract them, I get three halves pi minus negative three halves pi and that produces three pi. So that, that does verify that the period is pi. All right, and then last but not least, let's do the same type things um, with the secant function. So let's go ahead and um, I'm gonna grab the secant function here. Sorry, I didn't do that for you before. Um, and let's graph y equals two times secant x, and then also y equals secant x plus two. So the two times secant x is each y value gets multiplied by two. So where the y value was one, it's now two. Where the y value is negative one, it's now negative two, right? And the asymptotes, if I'm Stretching vertically, vertical asymptotes, if you stretch them, they just look the same, so they're not changing. And where I would normally hit this y value of two here, now I'm gonna hit the y value of four. You don't need to have that in there, I just like to kind of have it as a guide to make sure that my shape is okay. Be careful when you're doing this that you don't cross your asymptote like it looks like I just did. Also be careful that you're approaching the asymptotes to get closer and closer, but make sure you're not curving back in and failing the vertical line test on that. Uh, but you can see that this is going to be the graph of two times secant x. Also try and make sure that they're smooth at the maxes and mins and not pointy. So that would be the graph of y equals two times secant x. It would just stretch farther away from the x-axis. However, uh, the very last one that we're gonna do, which is secant x plus two, the plus two on this is a d value, which means that we're going to be shifting the entire graph up two units. So the y value of one would become a y value of three, and the y value of all of them actually, right? And the y values of negative one would become y values of positive one if I add two units um, to every y value in the graph. So the asymptotes, again, the asymptotes would stay the same here because I'm doing a vertical transformation, not a horizontal transformation. But I would have this piece as, ooh, sorry, that was a little pointy there on top. Uh, I would now have a graph that looks like this. So the, the bottom piece is now cross the x-axis, actually, because I've moved up the whole graph. Um, and let's hide the other one. It's a lot to look at. Um, so hopefully you can kind of get the picture of what we're doing and how we're manipulating these graphs. Uh, those are, we're not combining, there aren't very many graphs, especially in the um, homework I noticed, I was looking through your textbook and you might have two things out of the A, B, C, D, but you're not gonna have all of the A and the B and the C and the D. So I think that uh, you should be good to go for the big ideas assessment. Your homework for 9.5, um, is on big ideas, so you'll have a chance to see kind of how, uh, how they present it online. And best of luck to you as you go to do that. Have a lovely day, and goodbye.